Okay, we are continuing in the, in the Holy Book of the Kuzari. Uh, today we're going to talk about a topic that we started yesterday. As every year we start a topic, we continue a topic that we started the day before. But yesterday, if you remember, you to sales. <laughs> By the way, you were mentioned on the video. So you. your parents probably are going to watch this and like, why weren't you in class? How did I, I, I don't send them links. You guys should. <laughs> so, and if you want honorable mention on the video, just make sure I get the money prior to class with how to pronounce your name, especially if you have a weird name. Right, Baruch? Yeah. Right. Good. <laughs> now, um, we started talking about the capacity for prophecy. The capacity to connect to Hashem. And the Kuzari, the rabbi, explains to the king that Adam had this ability and it was transmitted. Let's think of it. I don't want people who, you know, sort of trying to nitpick. The easiest way for us to understand is through genetics. Right? So when you have in certain genes, they are transferred to your descendants. Now, it doesn't mean that it always transfers, right? Sometimes it can skip a generation. Sometimes this son might have it and this son doesn't have it, like with Avraham and you know, Yitzchak and Ishmael, and so on. This capacity for prophetic powers was something that was transmitted from Adam Arishon, transferred every generation all the way to Noah, and then from Noah to Shem, and from Shem on to Avraham Avinu, from Avraham Avinu to Yitzchak, Yitzchak to Yaakov, and then for some reason, all of Yaakov's sons had this genetic, I'm just using that as a term so we can understand, don't write letters, genetic propensity to connect to the Kaddosh Baruch through prophecy. And so the people who were the descendants of the 12 sons of Yaakov were also transmitted this particular quality. And that enabled us to participate in Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah in Har Sinai. That was yesterday. We covered that. Now we're all caught up. So the king says, okay, wonderful. They had this thing. They connected to Hashem. God revealed himself. Great. Yofi. What about the golden calf? Didn't they just blow it with their capacity? Maybe that capacity was burnt out, finished. Kaput. Right? That's what he says. He says, and fine, it was, you had it, but what remained after the, the sin of the golden calf? And now we're going to come to have a, a deeper understanding of what was the issue with the golden calf. Okay? It's not as simple as you think. It's not that you have a group of people who experience God on one day, and the next day they woke up and said, the heck with him, we're going to build an altar, and we want to serve an idol. Right? That wasn't what happened, and it wasn't overnight. It was where they waited 40 days, waited for Moshe Rabbeinu to return. There was a whole process. There was all sort of negotiations going behind the scenes what to do. So now we will get to the, the Kuzari's, Rabbi Yudha Levi's explanation of really what happened there. So he says, first of all, let's start from the beginning. In the beginning, all nations served idols. Is that a fair statement? As far as we know, from archaeological evidence, whether we're talking about Sumer, 
in the Mesopotamia, the Akkadian society, the Egyptians, the Canaanites, the Moabites, all the people around here, they all had what we would call images or idols, correct? Statues made out of wood or gold or stone. Some of them are well preserved that you could see, and some of them aren't so well preserved. When I was in New York, the, there's a museum called the Metropolitan Museum, very famous, of wonderful collections. And they actually reconstructed an Egyptian idol worshiping temple. In the, in the, in the, I don't know if they still have it. I haven't been to the Met in, I don't know, 20 years. So, but they used to have, and with, you could see the actual statues of the different deities that they had in this temple. So that was the norm, says the Kuzari, and L'chara, that seems to be, that was the case. And then, and if the philosophers would have come to any of those nations of the ancient world, and they would have said to them, listen, there's only one God, and this deity is one, that is unity of God, and that he is all-powerful. He says there is no way for those philosophers to be able to convince anyone to follow them unless they used idols. Right? The Greeks and the Romans, they had idols too. I don't want to get into other religions which came out of Judaism, whether they have idols or not, that's a whole question. And so, there was a level for humanity that they could not, they could not understand to worship a God, or to worship God, without having a physical manifestation of the power of God on earth. Just couldn't. That was the state of affairs. And says the Kuzari that they needed something physical to direct their attention, their spiritual attention towards. And they believed that this divine matter, right, this divine ability to, to speak, to connect to human beings, has to have a physical entity to attach itself to. And that was an idol. So now we're looking at an idol in something much more sophisticated than maybe you would have thought prior to this. That is, if you thought that they actually believed that this little statue that they are hugging and kissing and providing food then that's not what's going on here. It's not that they believe that this statue is God. No, they, they remember they went to the store and they bought it. I mean, they know. But what they believed, at least according to the Rabbi Yudha Halevi, was that this spiritual power that God has, has to rest, manifest itself on some physical body. And it's resting or manifesting itself in this statue. And therefore, when I put the fruits in front of the statue, cut up bananas, put some nuts, there's people who provide a meal before the statue. They know that when they come back, it's not going to eat it. They know it. They know that it's stone. But symbolically, they are, quote, feeding the deity, the God. Because it's manifesting in this, it, they needed something physical in order to connect to it. That was the state of affairs at the time where the Jewish people, the Israelites, are in Egypt and leaving Egypt. And so, some of this, these qualities, we also, even today, says the rabbi, we attach them to holy places. 
like the Wailing Wall, the Kotel. That is, there's some spiritual power. When we go to Tchevron, right, to the Kavarim of Avram, Mitzak, and Yaakov, there's some level of holiness in there that's attached where? To this physical place. The holy city of Tzfat. What makes the holy city of Tzfat holy? What? That's it? That's the reason. That's it. Zeu. There's something in that. Why do you think Arizal went to Tzfat? There's something holy to that place. So we see that even in Judaism, we do see Yerushalayim is considered a holy city. Why? Because there's something special about this. The Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, is holy. Has Kedusha. Why? Because there is something divine attached to this physical place. And so, we see them as a source of a blessing, as a source of inspiration, a source of growth. This is why this yeshiva is in the city of Yerushalayim and not in St. Louis. It's probably very hard to, to have this kind of yeshiva in L.A. Now, So he says, the majority, the common folks of the Jewish people could not, could not connect themselves to any Torah unless they can imagine that there's something, a physical image that they can connect to. They were not at the level that we are today that we don't really need that intermediary. But they were at the stage of human development that they just couldn't. That's the anything that when you think about that, everywhere they look, there were statues. Everywhere they look. You couldn't travel a road without seeing statues that from this religion and that religion, people had it. People would carry it in their pockets around their necks, right? What? Like today? No, I don't think so. People, Catholics, Catholics? No, they, no. They carry a cross. A cross is not an idol. The Ramah says in the Shulchan Ar, it's not an idol. It's just a symbolic, something to remember the story of what happened with Jesus. But it has, it's not, nobody worships the cross. That's a separate question already. We're not, he's just talking about this. Let's stick to, we're not doing, why aren't we all Christians? For that, call 1 800, you know. If they got hit by a semi trailer, they'd wear the same thing. Semi trailer. Or the West You said physical money. We're, yes. So the, it's it's yes. That is the only way that we can understand God's will in written form that it can be transmitted from generation to generation. That's how human beings, that's our, how our mind works. But you don't need an idol. That's a stage that we are in and for the last few thousand years. Okay. So, when the Jewish people left Egypt, they were promised by God, right, that God will send something to them that they can focus towards. And what did they have? They had the pillar of fire, right, during the day. At night they had the pillar of fire, and during the day it was the cloud which meant that they had something physical that they could focus on. It was a sign of divine presence. And obviously, they also had with them Moshe Rabbeinu. Wherever they turned, Moshe Rabbeinu was there. And so they had, when they were leaving Egypt, something that was physical, that expressed the existence of God and his relationship to them. 
So far, so good? Okay. So now, when the Jewish people heard the, in the Ten Commandments, and that Moshe Rabbeinu went up to the mountain, right? what they wanted, what they expect was that there's going to be something that Moshe Rabbeinu is going to bring down that is going to represent God on earth. Okay? And this is what they were waiting. They didn't change their clothes. They didn't change anything. They were sitting there and waiting for Moshe Rabbeinu to come down. Because according to them, what is he going to bring? He's going to bring something physical that they can focus. Now, what did he bring down? The luchos, the tablets. And where did the tablets were going to go? In Arona Kodesh, in the ark that melts Nazis. Right? The Ark of the Covenant. Saw that movie? It's a movie, Indiana Jones. Yeah, well, okay, I'm trying, I'm trying. This is... No, that's the wrong. Don't mix. That's like not only the wrong movie, but the wrong religion. Baruch, you're one second from having a dishonorable mention on the video. <laughs> it's going to ruin your shidduch. Okay, so, they're standing there. And Moshe Rabbeinu stays on the mountain for 40 days. He did not take anything with him when he went up. <clears throat> he didn't have pita bread, baruch, no hummus. He didn't have any water, nothing. He just went up. He didn't take anything with him. And he didn't even say to them, like, you know, I'll be gone for 40 days. He just said, I'm going up. And they don't know how long he's going to take. And so, they were very concerned that he's not coming down. They were very disappointed. There were individuals in the group, says Rabbi Levi here, that they believed that they were abandoned. That they were brought to this mountain, God appeared to them, and now you're on your own. That's it. And so the Jewish people at the time are starting to divide into different camps. Different people have different ideas of what they should be doing. And there are arguments, and let's do this, and let's do that, and let's all sorts of ideas. And some of them believe that they should create an image like all other nations so that they could, they could pray to the God of Israel through that molten image that physical entity is going to help them focus to connect to God. And, you know, there's sometimes, let's say for us, it's a message for us, sometimes a person says, you know, i got to pray to God. So what do you do? You stand in a room and you start speaking. And you're thinking in your mind that you're speaking to Hashem. There's nothing in front of you. There's no... It takes a certain level of, of spiritual maturity to be able to do that. It's not easy to stand and pray to God. And people think that prayer should come naturally. Yitzchak, prayer is like exercise. It's something that you have to work on. It's a skill. If you don't pray regularly, if you don't work on it, if you don't push yourself, concentrate, pay attention, then God forbid if a person needs to pray and he doesn't know how, he just stuck. He doesn't have this ability. And this is what's happening. They are in the desert. In the, by the mountain, and they don't know what to do. 
And so, says the Kuzari, they did not deny the divinity of, of he who took them out of Egypt. That's for sure not. They, didn't, they were never doubting that because they had a direct experience of Hashem. They knew exactly what happened. And so, they just wanted something physical that they can connect to so they could focus and pray to Him. That's what they wanted. And later on, in Bamidbar, it tells us once the Mishkan, the tabernacle, is built, and in the tabernacle there's an ark, right? What do we say? What do they say? And if you look at Bamidbar in chapter 10, it said they refer to the ark as Rise, O Lord, Kuma Hashem. Because they're using that Ark of the Covenant as a way of sort of channeling their spiritual energy to Hashem. Okay. And so, this is what we say when we look at the heavens. Right? People pray. You ever seen they look up? Why are you looking up? Why are you looking up? Is God up there? Yes. No. No, He's not. No. In order to be everywhere, you have to be at least somewhere. Aaron, play along. Yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. good. And in order to be somewhere, you have to occupy space. Yeah. And in order to occupy space, you must be a body. Mm-hmm. So in order to be everywhere, right, which is a lot of somewheres, you have to occupy space. And since we say that God is not a body, nor a power in a body, then God cannot be everywhere. So we say, oh, where is God? You can't apply the question of where to something that isn't physical. It's like asking, where's number 53? Where is it? No, 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 no. We're not taking questions. If you want to ask a question, get a note from Rabbi Kaplan that you can ask a question in th- at 3 o'clock. And I need it in writing and duplicate. Even better. Even better. Should we hear his question? People at home are like, come on, be nice to him, let him ask questions. Listen, I'm going to add, he's, you're going to hear his question, but you're not going to like it. Yes? Uh, Wi-Fi connection. They say there is a... Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> For example, okay, yes. thank you, sir. <laughs> Tzadik, anything that's measured, we said that. Anything that's measured is physical. So when we speak about, when I use the metaphor of Wi-Fi, it was just a metaphor. <clears throat> Just a metaphor. It was just a metaphor. Just, you can just a way. Spaces could be different, like to understood different, such as like messages, whatever we have, uh, like digi- digital. Is the information they do not exist in nature, but they exist in a digital space. So let's say we can say God exists everywhere because God. We just do not see it in a phys- in real physical. I, listen, I I was uh, taught that we don't take on letters. We don't argue against Rishonim. That might not be your background, but that's how I was taught. Yeah, so since the, Rambam, since the Rambam says <laughs> that God, you cannot apply the question of where to where God is, that's good enough for me. You want to make all this mental gymnastics and bend yourself into a pretzel so that you can feel good about saying God is everywhere but not physical space. It's only digital space. I don't know that that gets you anywhere. I, you know, I don't think that that's, that's where you should go. And you know people are throwing shoes at their computer because of your question. So that you know that. Okay. <laughs> what? He deserves his name to be said out loud. No. Because of that? No. He deserves it. I don't want to publicly embarrass why are you getting all red? Sorry. <laughs> it's gonna get redder. I know. It's even redder and redder. Wow. Did you tell him what I told you privately? Yeah. And what did he say? Teen. Yeah? Good. So we have to work that out. 
Tov. I was very surprised that that happened. Yeah. I wow. thought he wow. should have seen what they did last time they were there. Tov, we continue. And so, when we point to the heavens, when we pray, what are we really doing? We're simply signaling that all of the movements of the heavenly bodies are because of the will of God. That's all. It's just a chas v'shalom to think that really this is God? I mean, we're going to look at the sun and the moon and start praying to that? We're not going backwards in history. That was already Avram Avinu figured this out. Okay. Now, the sin of the people with the idol, says Rabbi Yudah Levi, was that they made an image so that it, they could focus their spiritual energy to connect to God. That was against what they were told. Certainly it was a sin. They were told, don't make images. And that they attributed divine power to something that they created. And they weren't commanded to do so. This is a very important point. When we serve Hashem, a lot of people have wonderful ideas of how we should serve Hashem. Some people believe that the way to serve Hashem is through dancing with girls. They believe it brings them closer to God. There are people who believe that, I don't know, sitting in meditations for hours on end, that's going to be, that's the key. And all sorts of other things that people invent. There are people who believe that you have to roll yourself in snow and pour boiling water on yourself, and that's going to bring you closer to Hashem. Rabbi Yudah Levi is saying, the way that we serve Hashem is only in the way that God commanded. The path to closeness to Hashem has been given to us in the Torah. We don't have to invent new things. There are plenty of commandments in the Torah. Do you know how many? 613, that's the minimum number. That's a, that should keep you busy. Right? If you're bored and you don't know what to do some after Sunday afternoon, trust me, pick one of them. Oh yeah, you can count the whole 613. Take your socks off, you might need it. And so Rabbi Yudah Levi says the sin was as follows. One is they created an image so that they could focus and connect to God. That was one. Two, that they attributed spiritual power to something that they created and that they weren't commanded to do so. If they were commanded to do so, to create a physical entity and attribute it physical power, then there won't be any problem. We have physical entities that have spiritual power. Like? Anybody? Spiritual entities that have physical power? No. Physical entities that have spiritual power. The Torah itself. One. What else? Mishkan. What? Today. That we have today. <laughs> you put them on your he- arm and your head. Fill in. Right? They have spiritual power and you put them, but it's physical. But we were commanded to do this. Tzitzis. Mezuzah. Mezuzah. Excellent. Even matzo. What are you excited about? Like, wow. Matzo. <laughs> The bread of affliction. You're like, yeah. <laughs> you can eat matzo now. No, I would rather not. Ah, okay, it's fine. So do you Menorah. Menorah. When you say menorah, what do you mean? Chanukia. Chanukia. So it doesn't have kedusha in itself, right? Because if you didn't have a chanukia, you just light candles, right? Take bottle caps. 
or just whatever it is. So that it's not a chefta shel mitzvah. We don't. I think everybody got it. Yes, but uh, fine. Le, hoodie, you you want your name mentioned on the video? I got it. He's doing well, mom. Yes. What? Don't now like get insulted and I don't. Get filter. Get filter fish. Yes, you're right. That was from. Ay, ay, ay. When you know when you open things up to a conversation, you just, sometimes you get answers that. What about chilling? What about chilling? <laughs> Why doesn't that? <laughs> now there might be non-Jewish folks who are watching this. And now they have to run around the internet figuring out, what is this gefilte fish? What is that? What's cholent? I never heard of that. So they can no, 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 no. That's that's just. I mean, you could almost combine the chopped liver to cholent. Almost. I mean, you could eat the, the chopped liver just before the cholent. That's okay. But gefilte fish with a chillin? That's not. What? what? Mm. You're a guy, what do you know? Oh. So. What about the carrot? Is that so heavy? <laughs> I'm sorry? <laughs> what did you say? The carrot <laughs> on top of the gefilte. Oh. Okay, good. I know you, you want your name mentioned. That's it. That's what you're trying to. No, I'm okay. You're good. Bo Hashem. So. We continue. So they, this was their big mistake. They felt they needed some physical entity so that they could channel their spiritual energy and connect to God. That was their big mistake. It's a big mistake. And also says the rabbi, there were how many Jews there? 600,000 men from the age of 20. How many actually worshipped this little idol? 3,000. 3,000. And so, most people did not serve. They were watching. They went to see what's going on. And that was also a problem. When you see your fellow Jew doing something that he shouldn't do, you have a certain responsibility to say, hey, you know I care about you. I know why I want what's best for you. This is not it. You're wrong. This is not how we do it. And so, in the end, the entire Chet HaEgel, the sin of the golden calf, was not that they abandoned serving the God who took them out of Egypt, but simply a transgression against one of his commandments. One of his commands was not to make images, and that's what they did. The, what they needed was to wait, to continue to wait for Moshe Rabbeinu, and not to create some sign from their own minds. And for themselves to decide that where we're going to pray and to create an, an altar and to provide sacrifices to this altar, all of that they did on their own. And that was their problem. Very serious problem. But that was it. It wasn't that they abandoned, they believed in the idol against Hashem. It was simply they wanted to serve Hashem. They just felt that they needed an intermediary, physical intermediary. We might just say they were, in terms of spiritual, their level of spirituality was infantile. It wasn't ready yet. And so they felt that they needed this sort of shortcut, which had terrible 
consequences. But it wasn't that they are abandoning the Kaddish Baruch. Okay? And now, why, how did this develop? Because part of the people that were saying what they should do, they were people who were worshipping other powers. They were used to astrology, all sorts of other things that they were doing in Egypt. And they're like, hey, you know, if we did this, if we did that, this could help us, that could help us. And so this is what was happening. They behaved according to the parable that the Kuzari brought a few pages earlier. If you remember, we talked about a doctor, a physician, who has all these different medica- med- medicines, and somebody breaks into his office and starts dispensing medicine to people. He's just giving them whatever they want. He just gives them this guy, this pill, that pill. He doesn't know what he's giving and, and why, but he just dispenses pills. Some people he kills, some people doesn't do anything, some people he harms, and some people, just by luck, are better. But not because he knows what is going on. And he says, that's what really happened over here. The Jewish people over there did not think about what they're doing. They thought that they are getting closer to God. They went to Aaron and said, hey, make us, we need this. So that they didn't, they, their motivation was in order to come closer to Hashem, to get closer. And it's a big danger. You sometimes feel like, I want to get closer to God. You have to understand that the only way, the only way that we can achieve closeness to Hashem is through following the Torah and what we call halacha. We follow Jewish law and through this following this Jewish law, we become closer and closer to the Kaddish Baruch. You cannot, you cannot create for yourself your own individual path. Within the Torah, within the boundaries that Hashem has set for us, we are allowed to find our place. Right? Some people feel their place is to wear black and white that helps them connect to Hashem. Some people feel that that's not exactly what's going to get them closer. So great, fine, there's no requirement. There's some people who believe that their emphasis is doing chesed, acts of loving kindness. There are people who believe that the way to connect to Hashem is through learning Torah. And so they spend more time learning and learning. There are people who put emphasis on this particular thing or that particular thing. But it all has to be within the boundaries of Jewish law. That's where we find our place and our way of serving Hashem. We will continue tomorrow, Mirza Hashem. Mincha should follow immediately.